another one of the biggest names in the NFL right now, Khalil Mack. Film we've got of him is on the Raiders. For some reason, he's on the Chicago Bears now. The Raiders decided to part ways with maybe the best pass rusher in the NFL right now. You saw him as a rookie. You also saw him your second, uh, his second year in the NFL as well. What, what does he do that makes you believe that he, he's one of the best? Well, when you break him down and you look at him, you say, okay, he's big. We get it. 6'2", 6'3", 260. He's really fast. Okay, we get that. We've seen that before. But he's also really strong and really smart. And when you start putting all those things together, there's really no weaknesses. There's no way for an offense to attack him or an offensive tackle to handle him that you can say, all right, this is how we can handle him all day because he doesn't do anything poorly. So you, you said he's unblockable. Your job is to block him. What, what's the game plan? So we were watching him the year that um, we played him in 2015, 14 maybe. Kyle Shanahan was the offensive coordinator. Everybody knows Kyle likes to run the ball. Everybody knows he likes to run the wide zone. And we pretty much in that game stopped running any wide zones towards <laughs> Khalil because both of our tight ends were getting split and beat on every single play. And that's not an exaggeration. We had the conversation on the sideline with Kyle that we can't run to Khalil Mack anymore <laughs> with, with just tight ends blocking him. It's impossible. So what we ended up doing in that game is we'd set the formation to Khalil, and then we'd either motion one tight end away or we'd just run weak and just get away from him because any run at him, he would just completely dish rag both of our tight ends and our offensive linemen when he had the opportunity. And he was making all these tackles in the backfield. So... He is extremely disruptive run and pass. I know from the, the play here, he doesn't get to the quarterback before the ball gets out, but it, it seems like he's going to make an impact that might be felt later in the game by just delivering the hit that he's able yeah, to. Yeah, when you have a defensive player going into the game that is going to get 10 to 15 hits on the quarterback, and the quarterback knows he's going to get hit by this guy a bunch. It affects his mentality the entire game. And we see on this snap here, even though Khalil doesn't get a sack, he's going to make a big hit on Josh. And that's something that Josh is going to feel. That probably broke his collarbone. I mean, the guy was 38 years old in this play. Uh, that's going to affect him the rest of the game. Not just from, ow, my shoulder is sore, but... That might be a Damn. penalty today. I don't want to hang on to the ball anymore because I'm going to get smoked. Yeah, I mean, so what is he doing there that, I mean, you're, you're, you're on him for a little bit, then he kind of is around that defensive tackle where you can't, you can't put a hand on him anymore. So this is just Khalil being smart because he gets to the depth of the quarterback. This isn't a called stunt, but he's getting to the depth of the quarterback and realizing if he keeps running upfield, he's going to run into Duke Johnson. But if he kept running in or kept running up the field and didn't run into Duke, the quarterback's just going to step up in the pocket. So these smart pass rushers realize, I'm going to get to the depth of the quarterback. If I don't have a free lane up the field to the quarterback, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fold back inside and be waiting for the quarterback when he steps up in the pocket. So you see Josh, he's going to like his second, probably third read here, which is Gary Barnage. And so he's climbing in the pocket. Khalil notices it. He stops. He loops inside and gets a really big hit. Because in this situation, I forget who this defensive tackle is, but... He's done a nice job getting up the field and getting penetration. He's about five yards deep in the backfield, which makes it really difficult to pass off any games. It's the guard's job to stop the defensive tackle within two to three yards of the line of scrimmage so that we can pass off those TE games and then the defensive end isn't able to fall back inside and make those hits on the quarterback as he climbs in the pocket. And just You mentioned when you, in 2015 after you played him, you, you believed he was headed to the Hall of Fame. What is he doing that's making him even better as he gets into kind of the prime of, of his Well, he's career. just getting more savvy. Like, I'm not going to say he's gotten stronger or faster or quicker. He may have, but what he's doing is he's just getting a better understanding of the game. And when you can understand what teams are trying to do to you, all of a sudden your productivity is going to go up 10 or 15% because you're going to be giving effort in different areas on the field and you're going to be trying different things taking different risks that pay off because you understand the game more yeah and it seemed like when he was with the Raiders he was a big name in the NFL but now he's with the Bears they seem to be on Sunday Night Football almost every single week <laughs> Chris Collinsworth loves this guy you're spotlighting him on every play even though people know who this guy is he's one of the biggest names in the NFL there really isn't an answer to him right now 
Yeah, when you're big, fast, strong, physical, tough, quick, <laughs> there's not really much you can do to try to stop him other than just somehow get the lead and then sit on it and run the ball away from him. Uh, <laughs> but he's on a really good defense right now in Chicago. When you're in those close games and you've got the leads and the offense has to throw, that's when you're licking your chops and you're going to make some enormous impact plays. So tell me, what what, what is the, the job to just at least limit him? To, to maybe not not completely wipe him out of the game, but yeah. just to slow him down just a little bit. Really, the, the best thing that you're going to try to do is if you line up a tight end over him and the tight end hits him, and then that buys your tackle a half a second to get out of his stance to be able to block him, that would be your best bet. But at the same time, you don't want to waste the tight end on every play trying to hit Khalil Mack. So you're going to maybe do that half the time. Because you know the half that you don't do it, he's going to probably have an impact on the play. And you're just hoping that somebody else can get open before he beats your tackle. It, it seems like now, though, too, he's not just getting to the quarterback. He's getting the ball, too. Yeah. I mean, is that something that you see from these pass rushers as they get older? It, yeah. it seems like they're, they're maybe just focused on dropping the guy. Then it's like turning it into major game-changing plays. Yeah, that was one thing that Greg Williams kind of challenged Miles Garrett in the last couple of weeks was, hey, the sacks are great. I'm not going to argue <laughs> with the sacks, but when you get there, don't just knock the guy over. Have a plan. You got an opportunity to make a big play and turn it into an enormous game pivoting play that could win the game for your team if you just take the ball out of their hands. And a lot of times these guys are getting there so fast that instead of just tackling the quarterback, go grab the ball. You're bigger than them. Don't tell me that if Khalil Mack's playing Josh McCown in an arm wrestling or they're wrestling over a ball, Khalil Mack's not going to be bigger and stronger. So use that to your advantage. If you're getting there so quickly, that's one of those things that I think as you become an older, more savvy player, you're looking for the details. How can I do more? Now, I'm not faster or stronger, but I can do more because I'm smarter. So get to the quarterback, find a way to get the ball out of their hands, run to the end zone. It's pretty simple. <laughs> so it seems like, though, if he's big, strong, and fast, he's going to have a bigger effect as the game goes on because it doesn't seem like this guy gets tired at all either. Well, that's another thing that makes him great is he's not a guy that gets worn out by the fourth quarter. It seems like he only gets stronger. And right when, as an offense, you're starting to get tired or your offensive tackle is tired of blocking him, he gets better. He's got another gear left in there, and you just don't have that. Yeah, and, and what we saw in the clip, though, was he, make, he made a hit earlier on McCown, and it didn't result in, a, in anything on that play. But when you get back in that huddle, do you notice it with a quarterback after a guy starts taking hits? I mean, what kind of yeah. long-term effect can that have on, on a guy throughout the course of a game when you know you're getting your quarterback hit and mm -hmm. he's not feeling all that great. Well, mentally it, it hurts uh, when you're an offensive lineman and your only job is to keep your quarterback and your running back clean and those guys are getting whacked. It doesn't feel so good. But when a quarterback comes to the huddle after a big hit like that, I mean, a lot of times they've got the wind knocked out of them or their arm is hurting and you know that it's going to affect them on the next play, even if they're just handing it off. And just like anything, you know, if you're taking wax at that block of granite, you're just taking little pieces off. Pretty soon, that thing's going to be nothing but little crumbles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Josh McCown in this game, he's a tough guy, but you can't take many big hits from a 260 pound defensive lineman when you're not protecting yourself. Because as a quarterback, you're standing back there, you're holding the ball, you're throwing the football. You're not protecting yourself like anybody else on the field. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier about the 2014 game. You guys stopped running in his direction. There's a lot of good pass rushers out there who maybe aren't that good against the run. What is the, what's, for, what's the secret for a guy to be really good at both? Well, he makes a lot of blockers miss, and he's really good almost from a martial arts standpoint of understanding, balance, and he sees and he can feel that if an offensive tackle or a tight end is leaning on their hands or, or trying to lean forward, He's going to use that to your advantage, and he's going to get your hands, his hands on you, and he's going to snatch you down, and he's going to make you miss. And most negative runs are either a guy that had a mental error and didn't block the right guy, or a guy on offense fell to the ground, and the defensive lineman olayed him, and he's yeah. just right there making the tackle in the backfield. Now, we've had the discussion about Aaron Donald being a potential MVP candidate. Is this guy right up there too? I mean, does he affect the game that much from that position? Yeah, he's, he's affecting the game, and I think he's, he's been incredible. And the impact he's had on the Bears can't be argued. I think just today, if you're asking me right now, I think Aaron Donald's making more of an impact from his position.
But what, and you mentioned Vic Fangio, what he does with the Bears. Are you seeing now him being used even differently than he was with the Raiders? Well, I think w when he's with the Raiders, they were playing a little bit more base defense type stuff. Um, and the benefit is the Bears are a really good team. And so <laughs> when you're playing with the lead, you're able to be a little bit more creative from a defensive standpoint. And they're not afraid to draw stuff up just to try to get Mac free, uh, which not to say that the Raiders weren't trying to do that, but it does make a difference when you are playing with a lot of other good players around you. And a lot of times you are playing with the lead. Yeah, put on your GM hat for a second. You get a call. Khalil Mack is available mm -hmm. for two first-round picks. Are you mm -hmm. making that trade right away? Yeah, I don't see why you wouldn't want to make that trade. <laughs> you got to figure that the burnout rate for first-round picks is about 50%. You know, long term, if you look at all the first round picks, maybe in the last 20 years, 50% of them turned in to be good players, 50% didn't. So if you can tell me that for two first round picks, I can guarantee I'm going to get a Hall of Fame pass rusher, that's a no brainer because I could take those two first round picks and I can just assume one of them is probably not going to work out. And is the other one going to be a Hall of Famer defensive end if I'm really smart and I'm really lucky as a GM? So that's a no brainer. Is there, what, how many more years does he have to do this to be a lock in your mind for Canton? I think it seems the cutoff for Canton is about seven years. It's kind of been that way. And if you got 10 good years like that, then people start talking about you being a lock at that position. Um, but if you have seven great years like that, I, I don't see that he wouldn't get in. Yeah, and then what's the, what's the thing that'll go away first? You say he's got the big, strong, fast. Mm -hmm. what, what will he have to... Mm -hmm. maybe adjust as, as, as father time takes. Yeah. Takes so time. as you get older, really your strength levels are going to continue to improve through your thirties and into your forties. We always see the world's strongest men competitions, yeah. these big power lifters. A lot of these guys are in their thirties and late thirties because you can continue to get stronger. And a lot of times you do the into your thirties, almost into your forties, but that quickness, that explosiveness, that's the stuff that you're at your peak when you're 22, mm -hmm. 23, and the, every year it's gonna decline a little bit. But that's where you hope that your intelligence, your understanding, your savvy, that's gonna improve so that as your physical abilities, your explosiveness and your quickness, as they decline, your savviness is going up at a faster rate so that you're able to play faster, even though maybe necessarily you're not as good at the three cone drill or the pro agility or the 40 yard dash you're going to actually play faster. And it seems like right now it's where it's hitting at the – That's right. They're converging right now. That's why a lot of times when you look at defensive linemen, especially those fast pass rushers, their sweet spot is like 27, 28 years old. You know, right around your fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh years in the league, that's kind of your sweet spot because that's where your understanding of the game and your athleticism have kind of – reach that pinnacle and then after that your your skills kind of start to drop off a little bit faster and you're not learning as much new things about the game because you've really the most that you learn about the game is between years one and let's say four yeah well from our point of view it was a great thing that he was headed to the nfc my team a lot in the preseason yeah. but but not a ton in the regular season that's that's a good guy to keep in the other conference I think. yeah it's good that the uh raiders don't have him anymore because it seemed like for a while the browns had to play the raiders almost every year yeah might have to play him again next year too so <laughs> it's good that we won't be seeing him then didn't have to see him this year as well